Would you thank the worship team with me this morning? Well, it is good to be with you here today. I believe I have a word for our church, and God, I believe, wants to do great and mighty things in our lives. Would you agree with that? Amen. God loves us so much. Today, I want to talk to you about God's amazing grace. Because if you and I can plug into God's amazing grace that is always there for us, God's amazing grace, I believe, changes everything for us and in us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, it is a word that we say often. But I believe we don't realize how amazing God's grace truly is. There's not a Christian on the face of the earth that has not heard that word. And having heard it, I believe what we do is instinctively come up with an assumption of what grace means. And so God's grace, God's grace. So when you say grace, most of us hold on to the notion that grace means this. God's merited, unmerited favor. How many of you have heard that definition before? Grace is God's unmerited favor. Right? Because we don't earn it, we don't deserve it, right? And so a lot of times we believe, we make an assumption that God's grace means God's unmerited favor upon our lives. And what's interesting when we, when we say that, that it's God's unmerited favor, we naturally accept and assume that grace is God's unmerited favor because God is favorably disposed to us. Would you agree with that? God is favorably disposed to us, though we don't deserve it. So it is a true statement. God is good to us, though we don't deserve it. So because we know that this is true, so when someone says that's what God's grace is, we say, well, it must be. Because He is good to us, and we don't deserve it. But listen, I believe God's amazing grace is so, so much more than God's unmerited favor upon our lives. And I believe this is our Western way of reducing a spiritual truth to a formula. I once heard, it was probably about 20-something years ago, I heard uh, this pastor, Pastor Ryle, and he described grace for me, and it kind of opened up for me kind of the true meaning of what grace is all about. And I think it's important that we get a hold of what grace is. And so, I believe that traditional thought is that grace is unmerited favor, but that is more what mercy is. And it kind of overlaps a, a little bit, uh, but really it has nothing to do with God's grace. What is God's grace? Well, whenever you look how the Bible looks at the word grace, it's quite clear that it really has nothing to do with God's unmerited favor on our life. And I, I, I want to set a presence on this that we truly understand what grace is about because we limit it to kind of a, a small phrase. Our, our, in our Western world, we limit it to a kind of a bumper sticker. And I believe grace truly loses its meaning of how amazing God's grace is. If grace is unmerited favor, why does, only, why does God only give it to the humble? Because God gives grace to the humble. It's a merit. He's giving grace to the humble. Clearly, something is meriting. It is their humility, so God gives it to them. Now look at Luke 2.40 on your outline this morning, and I want to kind of flesh this word out a little bit to show the true meaning. It says in Luke 2.4, this is talking about Jesus, 2.40, the child continued to grow, talking about Jesus, and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the, say it with me, grace of God was upon him. 
If grace is unmerited favor, does that fit in this text? No, because Jesus merits that favor, right? And so it doesn't fit in the context that he increased in wisdom and in grace was upon him. Because his unmerited favor doesn't fit in the context of who Jesus is. Because we're talking about Jesus. Again, if grace is unmerited favor, it is right to say that unmerited favor is upon us. But it's not right if we say unmerited favor was upon Jesus. There's a problem there. And so, look at the next verse here in John 1.14. Again, talking about Jesus. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Again, it doesn't fit that Jesus was full of unmerited favor and truth. No, because it is so much more than that. And so when you take the definition of that word as unmerited favor and try to plug it in with the verses of grace, it truly doesn't fit. And so if that word doesn't fit in there, what is grace? What is grace? Here's a definition for you, and you probably won't see, but I believe this is the intent of the word that is so powerful. Grace is... You can look on your outline here, the definition of grace. Grace is the empowering presence of God, enabling you to be what God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. And so we see grace is the empowering presence of God. It makes a whole lot more sense. It's not something that God does for you. It's something that God himself in you. The empowering presence of God in us. It's not a gift from God. It is God himself the gift. Grace is the presence of God in your life. But not just the presence of God. It is the fully unleashed, empowering presence of God in your life. For the express purpose of enabling us to be what God has created you to be and to do what God has called you to do. Would you guys read this definition with me? Ready, go. Grace is the empowering presence of God, enabling you. Now let's look back at those two scriptures. The child continue to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom and in the empowering presence of God. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, O oh Father, if this cup can be passed from me, let it pass, but if not, let your will be done. And so we see that Jesus was enabled having the power to do what he was called to do and to be what he was called to be. And then in John 1.14, And when the world became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of the empowering presence of God. You see how it fits. And so we see grace in the context of who Jesus is, is not unmerited favor. It's the empowering of the Lord himself. Jesus was all God in human form. And so we see that in the context that grace, and I'm going to say it over and over again so we get it, that grace is the empowering presence of God. Because if we live in that grace, we will radically be changed. We'll radically see things different. We'll radically do things different because we know that God's grace is there available for us to do what God has called us to do and to be what God has called us to be. That's why God's grace is so important. Unmerited favor is mercy. God doesn't give us what we deserve and he gives us what we don't deserve. That's mercy. God's grace is his empowering presence in our lives. And so it's so important 
And then we see how it translates. Let's go to Acts 33. It says this, And with great power, say great power, great power. the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant, say with me, grace. grace was upon them all. So here we see the disciples had great power in giving their testimony of, of the resurrected Christ. And they had abundance of grace was upon them. So was the abundance of unmerited favor upon them? Well, really, what was upon the apostles? The empowering presence of the Lord. How many of you know what the disciples were about? The upper room. The healings. They had the holy boldness under persecution to go out and to preach the gospel that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And God's abundant grace was upon them. God's empowering presence was upon the disciples. And so we see that. The unleashed, empowering presence of God was on the disciples' life. And so Paul is writing and telling, when the disciples were proclaiming the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, something was happening to the crowd. The empowering presence of God was upon them. Manifest proof that Jesus was alive by the presence of the Lord coming upon them. And here is what I want to share with you on these statements of grace. The first one is grace and power go hand in hand. They always show up at the same time. Grace and power. Hmm. With great power, the apostles testify of the resurrection and the grace was upon them. Power and grace. Power and grace. Acts 11, 21 and 23, and it says this, And the hand of the Lord was upon them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and he witnessed what did he witness? Grace. The grace of God. What did he witness? Grace. The empowering presence of God. He rejoiced and he began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. Barnabas saw the grace of the Lord. He saw the hand of the Lord upon them. What did he see? He saw lost men and women being saved. He saw sick people being healed. He saw demon-possessed people being delivered. He saw the power of God present upon a people, and he called it the grace of God. Because it is the grace of God, folks, that enables you and me to do what God has called us to do and to be what God called us to be. Today we are launching a brand new church on Main Street at 2 o'clock. It's called, a, it's called a Recover Church. So if any of you are born at 2 o'clock and you want to come and help support, we're at 311 right across from Valhalla's restaurant. We're going to be there. And I wanted to set out to have a church that is not a hotel for saints where people get catered to but to really have a hospital for the hurting, for the least of these. And I believe in my heart, if Jesus was here, he would go out to the least of these. There's a group of about 16 of us yesterday went to the bus stop, went all around Main Street, and giving flyers to homeless people. We've gone to recovery, we've gone to group homes, and we're reaching out to those who have hurts, hangups, and habits. And when you do that, nothing will change in their lives. Nothing will change in our lives without the empowering presence of the living God. It is more than unmerited favor. It's God working in our very hearts 
and in our very lives. He saw the power of God present upon these people, and he calls it the grace of God. So grace and power go hand in hand. And then number two, grace is shown in the evidence of God. It's shown in the evidence of God, meaning God shows up. Meaning when God's there, things happen. In the spiritual realm, you can't fake certain things. <laughs> Some people try to fake the gifts, but there are certain spiritual things you cannot fake. Salvation, a changed life, a healing, a deliverance. Those are works of the living God in our lives. Look what it says in Acts 14.3. Acts 14.3. It says, therefore, meaning Paul and Barnabas, they spent a long time there speaking boldly, say boldly, oh, with reliance upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of His grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. See, that has nothing to do with unmerited favor, and it has everything to do with the power and the presence of the living God. Amen? Amen? They were talking boldly that Jesus is alive. They were testifying the word of grace, the empowering presence of God is here. And they prayed for healing, and people were healed. How did you do that? They asked. We didn't do it. Grace did. The empowered presence of God did it. So we see in Jesus, the empowering presence was there. We see the disciples, the empowering presence of God was there. And we might say, well, yeah, that's Jesus. And yeah, that's the disciples. They spent three years with Jesus. And so, yeah. But listen, God's grace, God's presence, God's empowering presence is for you to do what God has called me to do. To do what God has called you to do. To walk in the center of His will, fulfilling a purpose, to seeing that people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and miracles and those things were done as a testimony of the presence of the Lord. I want to challenge you to know that God's grace is for us. God's power is for us. There's a verse that I just thought about in between services, and it goes along with the message. You remember when Paul the Apostle, it says, had a thorn in the flesh? He had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was, but there was something in Paul's life that was bothering him. It could have been a sin. It could have been, some people say he... He was losing the sight, but it was a thorn in the flesh, and he prayed three times, Lord, take this away from me. And not just three times, like right in a row, probably three occasions just really pressing into the Lord. Lord, take this thorn of the flesh away from me. And as he comes to the end of that, he writes, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. <laughs> what is he saying to Paul? My empowering presence in your life is sufficient for you. For my power, isn't it interesting? We see grace and then we see power again. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Not powerful. We all need God's grace. I got a call yesterday. I have a cousin, 27. He died yesterday. And my cousin calls me.
And you pray for the grace of God to intervene in this situation. Where people are hurt. You say, oh God, by your grace, will you come? I was praying, oh God, by your empowering presence, would you intervene in this situation? And I prayed and I just listened to you all. We need God's grace in every area of our lives. And there are people all around us that need the grace of God. Grace is for us. Write this down, number three. Grace is given to equip the believer for service. Again, God has a purpose for each and every one of us. Amen. It's that we share His empowering presence with others that they may experience the living God. Ephesians 4, 7 says this, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. And this can apply in a couple different ways. The measure of Christ's gifts, well, the measure of Christ's gift is is to the fullest extent, meaning God's grace never runs out. And then the other extent could be this, that God gives us the grace that we need to do what we need to do and to be what we need to be. God's grace is always there. Paul says, His grace is sufficient for me. Even in my weakness, God's power is there. Why? Because of His grace is the presence empowering us. So that's why we can proclaim with boldness. That's why we can do the things the apostles do. That's why we can preach because we are anointed to preach the good word, the good news, to see the captive set free, that the blind can see. God's grace, I believe, is upon each and every one of us. We need to plug into it. We need to know that it is there for us. Now listen, God's not going to give us that measure of grace if we're following outside of that purpose. God's not going to give you a measure of grace so you can keep going in your sin. That's why it's important we're doing what God calls us to do and to be what God has called us to be. Because when we do that, His grace is there for us. The last verse this morning is found in John 1.16. It says, For of His fullness we have all received. For His fullness we have all received. And grace upon grace. That's a lot of grace. It's like a grace that never runs out. There is no end to the supply of His grace because there is no end to God. Because grace is not something God gives. It is who God is. I'm going to ask Pastor Kim to come up and to close. God's empowering presence upon Jesus. God's empowering presence on the apostles. God's empowering presence on us. God is so good. He gives everything that we need. Amen. Plug into God's grace. Pastor King. Amen. Good work. Nothing better than God's grace. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, I love that definition. Uh, if we can take a look at that definition that... Pastor Brian shared with you guys. Uh, it says, Grace is the empowering presence of God, enabling you to be what God has called you to be and to do what He has called you to do. You see, grace isn't just for saving us, it's also for sending us and to be everything that God wants us to be. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. The two greatest days in your life, apart from salvation, number one, the day you were born, and number two, the day you discover why you were born. And that's what God's grace is, not only to save us, but then now it's God to intervene be part of our life and say, here's what, I, here's what I've gifted you to do. This is who I've made you to be. 
and now that grace empowers us to be who we're supposed to be, to do what we're supposed to do. Amen? Amen. Good word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace that has saved us. Thank you for your grace that empowers us to be everything that you have called us to be and to do all that you have called us to do. You have a plan and a purpose for each and every one of our lives. Lord, every person in this room, Lord, you desire to empower, to do great exploits for the kingdom of God. So often, Lord, we rely on grace for salvation, but we, we don't think about the grace of God to empower us and, 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 and to walk in the presence of God, to do great things for the kingdom of God. Lord, I pray that we would daily pray and ask for your presence in our life and your power, that we would walk in your grace so that your grace would empower us not just to do great things for the kingdom, but also that we might have victory in, over the battles and the struggles that we have each and every day. Not just for our sake, but for your sake. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the lives of your people. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your empowerment in our lives, Lord, that we can do great things. Thank you, Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Nobody looking around. If you're here this morning and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, you've never really experienced the grace of God and the forgiveness of God uh, in your life, then it's not coincidence that you're here today. God wants you to walk in His grace. And I'm not going to have you, you know, stand up or walk forward or come to the altar this morning. But if you're here today and you're saying, you know what, I need to accept Christ as my personal Lord and Savior today. Or maybe you, you did that years ago in Sunday school, but since then life's happened and you're not sure if you're even right with God. Don't leave this place with God. Leave this place knowing that you're His and He is yours. And so this morning, if you need to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, this private moment, all I want you is just raise your hand. If that's you, just raise your hand. Thank you. I see your hand. I see your hand. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Thank you. Church, let's pray. I want to lead you in a prayer. Repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your amazing grace. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for laying down your life so that I would have life everlasting. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And become Lord of my life. All the days of my life. Till one day. I will stand. In your very presence. In glory. In Jesus name. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen.